I'm Kenny Moore II from the Indianapolis Colts, and this is the NFL Report. Welcome into the NFL Report on a Thursday. James Palmer, Steve Weich with you. I am heading for vacation next week. Steve's going to be heading to the owner's meeting, so him and Judy Batista are going to have a dynamite show on Monday. Check out the guest list for that one when Monday rolls around. But how about our guest list? You saw him right there. Kenny Moore, the Indianapolis Colts, re-signed their star slot corner to a massive new contract. We love to talk about that position on this show, Steve. Also, we have Brian Baldinger breaking down which three teams improved themselves the best through the trenches. Also, yeah. Lance Zerline, speaking of the trenches, talks about the top edge rushers in this draft, where they could potentially go off the board. We'll also have Alvin Irby, who in an Inspire Change initiative with the NFL, Steve, he is the founder of Barbershop, was it Books? which is an incredible initiative to get kids to go out there and read. And I know, Steve, you spent some time in a higher institution. That was the University of Southern California at their pro day with Caleb Williams. I need to know what happened at that pro day when everybody knows he's going number one to the Bears. Yeah, I mean, look, a, a really interesting thing. Real quick, Kenny Moore, by the way, JP, is the first repeat performer, I yes. think, here, our, sec our second time around. Oh, he, yes, here he is. On the NFL Report. So, Kenny Moore, right on. Can't look forward to have, I looking love it. forward, I should say, to having you back on. Well, let's get to Caleb Williams because, again, we're all assuming safely that he's going to be the first overall pick. And the Chicago Bears, who have that pick, they came about eight deep, James. It's standing right behind Oof. Caleb during this workout was Matt Eberflus, the head coach, Ryan Poles. The assistant GM. You're seeing Eberflus and Poles right there, right behind him, over his right, right shoulder, there. keeping a close eye on him. There's a Poles lot of communication shades. between all the Bears brass and Caleb throughout the morning. So, But the one thing with Caleb that we saw was that, you know, he stayed in the pocket, right? Nothing real flashy. Like, this is how good I can be under calm circumstances, That's which interesting. wasn't the case uh, for most of his junior season at USC, even though the year before he was absolutely fantastic in winning the Heisman. So after this workout, which is calm, who collected 50 scripted throws, no tight ends as part of that workout, I caught up with Caleb, and here's what he had to say about some of the next moves coming up. Yeah, I'm sitting here with Caleb Williams, and Caleb, uh, a, a nice a nice workout right there. Just your assessment and also the fun you had, because we saw you laughing with your guys, hugging up everybody after the workout. Yeah, um, that's always one of the most important things um, is, is to have fun. I made sure my guys... Um, heard that a bunch of times, uh, whether it was last night when I sent him a text, and then um, throughout this, you know, this morning and this day so far, uh, making sure that was the first and first thing that I said to them um, in, in the text or when I'm talking to them. So um, I had to go out there and show that I was having fun um, and lead by example, and then obviously go out there and, and, and handle business. Now we knew the majority of your workout was going to be from the pocket. Just kind of assess how you think things went. Yeah, um, I missed a couple. I missed a couple of passes um, down the field, uh, deep ball wise, vertical, um, and then I had I think one or two, uh, I think one uh, behind my receiver. Um, so, you know, work on those things. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. It, it still was a, a yeah. very good workout. No, thank you. Look, we know you're the presumptive number one pick. Yep. Uh, the Bears had a large contingent here. In fact, Coach Matt Eberflus and Jim yeah. Ryan Poles right behind you. Just the fact that they traded Justin Fields and they cleared some runway for you to land. Yep. Um, is that your full expectation to be to be headed there? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I wouldn't say it's my full expectation. Obviously, things can happen. Things can change um, throughout this time. I think it's around 33 days or so, 30 days um, until, you know, April 25th. And so, um, you know, a lot can change. Um, and you take it day by day. Handle it and handle and control what you can control. And with that, I was talking to your head coach here at USC, Lincoln Riley, and he said expectations is something you've dealt with even coming out of high school. Today, yeah. all 32 teams were here. Yep. How have you and, and how do you deal with everything that's going to be expected of you? Yeah, first and foremost, um, I have a great mom and dad. It starts there. It started there um, from when I was born and them raising me um, to this 22-year-old now. Um, and then, you know, I took, in, I took my own road. Um, and, 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 you know, as I got older, um, then obviously I got Coach Riley. Um, I've had coaches in high school, Coach Randy Trivers. Uh, Danny Schefter and, and and things like that to you know help keep molding me um, and I'm still molding. Um, I'm not gonna be the man I am, um, you know, many years from now, 20 years from now when I retire hopefully and, um, and and can play ball hopefully for a really long time. Great. Last question. Just what what's next? I mean, what's on your schedule in terms of, of visits, things like that? Yeah. So we're still figuring the visits out. Um, 
we'll have all of that solved pretty here pretty soon. Uh, we wanted to make sure we uh, came out here, put on a show for everybody, um, and, and focusing on my training for you know my first my first game in OTAs of, of the NFL. I know it's the last question, but quickly, Keenan Allen. Yeah, he was here. Receiver. Yeah, he was here. What, yeah. what about seeing him? And, it was great. Uh, you guys hanging great. out for a minute? Yeah. So I've known I've known Keenan for a little bit now. Hung out. Um, he was at the he was at the Chargers at the time, obviously, um, and then um, you know now he's at the Bears for like it says here for a fourth round pick, which is crazy. He had his best <laughs> year last year, but right. um, you know he's a beast, um, good guy, um, awesome dude to be around. He can give you not a lot of knowledge. All right, Caleb. Hey, yeah. thanks for the time, man. Thank well you. done. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Take care. All right. All right, JP. A couple things I just want to make sure to clarify coming out of that interview. First off, even though he Great. said he's going to go on his visits after the workout, the Bears brass was there. I was told by someone there they got there Monday. They had dinner with Caleb. They spent time with him. So they've done a tremendous mm. amount of homework. The communication going on between the Bears and Caleb really leaves no question as to what's going on. And when I said, "Do you expect to be the the, the pick by the Bears?" And he was like, "Well, I can't expect it." He wanted to say yes, but he says, look, you know, they could trade the pick. They can do this or that. Some folks on social media were like, well, he didn't sound too enthusiastic. He'll be just fine if he gets drafted by the Chicago Bears. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I love that Keenan Allen was there. I, I mean, I've that? never seen Ever. a player <laughs> that is probably going to be the number one target of that quarterback that's going to go number one at the pro day. I've just never seen it. You see guys go back to their alma mater. Uh, Keenan Allen's a Cal guy. So this is USC. He was right? there to see his future quarterback, which I thought was really cool. Um, the second part of it, Steve, is I love that you described this as the exact opposite of what we've seen from a lot of top quarterbacks. And what can they do with wow throws? What can they do moving? I remember going to a variety of these from Trevor Lawrence to Mac Jones to CJ Stroud. What can you do athletically outside of the pocket? That's what we need to sell these scouts on. That's not anything Caleb Williams needs to sell anyone in the NFL on, on what he can do with his legs outside of the pocket, creating, scrambling, what he was able to do inside the body. And the big thing I hear as I throw this back to you around the league is his footwork staying within the pocket right. is maybe unmatched in this draft coming up. And that is extremely important with messy pockets in the NFL. And I love that that's the kind of the approach he had with this pro day. And that's one of the things that a lot of people say, give the comparison to Patrick Mahomes. Not that he's Mahomes but footwork and things like that. Somebody who knows a lot about Caleb Williams is head coach Lincoln Riley brought him from Oklahoma to USC. I caught up with him, and here are some thoughts about Caleb's future as he goes to the NFL. Way. Yeah, I, I think he probably will be just about as prepared as you could be to go into a situation like that, and that's one of those things that you know you probably can't completely simulate it until you actually get in the middle and experience it, but... You know, winning a, a Heisman Trophy at USC, you know, in the middle of Los Angeles is probably about as close as you can get. And so he's, he's used to being under the microscope. Um, he's used to kind of having his game and everything he does and everything that he says dissected every which way. Um, there's certainly some new challenges, and I know he's going to have some ups and downs just like every rookie that goes into that league. But, um, you know, he loves the game. I think he's going to continue to improve, and I think you know whatever team he ends up with will be very happy with him. Hey, Coach, lastly, when, just when you look at the metrics of everything he's done, for only 14 interceptions in his three years as a starter, one that tells you he's accurate, but two, he's a good decision maker. In coaching him and seeing all of that high touchdown to low interception ratio, how do you think that translates to the NFL? Because we know those are two things that are significant at playing at that level. Yeah, I think it's important. I mean, I think it shows that he values the ball. Um, you know, sometimes I think people turn on a highlight and they think he's just this reckless player that's this gunslinger. And honestly, he's not. He's, he's at times, even early in his career, was even maybe even more conservative than I wanted him to be. But he always valued... Uh, taking care of the ball. He always had a patience um, that honestly was even better on game day than it was on the practice field, which for a lot of young QBs, it's the opposite. Um, he always seemed to kind of calm down and settle down and even be a little bit more patient on game day, even as a young player, which I loved. And so, um, so yeah, it's going to be obviously very important as the windows tighten down in that league, uh, as you face the type of pass rushers that, that he's getting ready to face. Um, but to show that, that he's already had that ability at a young age, I think bodes well for him. Great. 
Oh, what insight from Lincoln Riley with you there, Steve, into the makeup of Caleb Williams. The main things that jump out at me, one, is the way he maybe takes more risks in practice, which is probably where you should be right. with, the, with the football at the quarterback position, and a little more you know, deliberate with the way he throws it during the games when you have 1,099 pass attempts and 14 interceptions over three years, I think is pretty good at protecting the football because the last three years with the Bears, they had 15 interceptions, 15 interceptions, and 20 interceptions. Caleb Williams, 14 over his last three. I look at the receiver group that he's going to walk into, Steve, and you look at Keenan Allen and DJ Moore and Cole Komet and Gerald Everett. All of these guys have high football IQs. And they're where they're supposed to be. And I think that's huge for the system that he's walking into. And, and that's going to be perfect. Look, the one thing, again, 93 career touchdowns as a collegiate starter, 14 interceptions. He has put the ball Oof. on the ground with fumbles. Okay, again, the, the, the numbers are all over the place in what we've seen. True. But he has put the ball on the ground. Hasn't lost many, but that's something he is going to have to tighten up. But like you said, if he go, when he goes to Chicago, the situation is much better than what Justin Fields walked into a couple years ago yep. when he was the first-round pick. Well, coming up, we're talking about quarterbacks going into good situations. Brian Baldinger is going to let us know which teams have improved in the trenches, including those teams that might be drafting a rookie quarterback. Next on the NFL Report. Roll that tape, though. Welcome back into the NFL Report. James Palmer, Steve Weich. I have my popcorn. That means back. Baldy. We're back in the thick of things. We're evaluating yep. everything. Post-free agency, Brian Baldinger joins us for Baldy's favorite films. And Baldy, we came to you with this question. Your three teams that during free agency improved themselves in the trenches. We'll start with number Ooh. three, Carolina Panthers. Two massive guards come there in Robert Hunt and Damian Lewis. What do you see out of what Carolina did? I do like that those guys have blocked for shorter quarterbacks in their past in Russell Wilson and Tua Tunga Vailoa. I'm not sure if that matters, but they have. Well, um, you know, Bryce Young isn't the biggest guy, but he needs better protection than what we saw last year. I mean, you're going to take Bryce number one, like they did. And there was a struggle by everybody in that organization. Coaches fired, GMs fired, everything changed. You got you to do your very best to support your franchise quarterback and give him every opportunity mm-hmm. to be successful. And I think Robert Hunt played very good for the Miami Dolphins. They ran the ball very strong. Uh, Tua had a good season, back-to-back good years there, especially when healthy. And Damian Lewis has been doing that, you know, in Seattle. So I think they got two really good guards. They, I think they got to figure out the center position still, but it's a good draft for centers. I would expect them to draft one. Uh, you know, Austin Corbett got hurt last year, and it just kind of crumbled. But I think Carolina, I, I, they they look better inside right now with Hunt and Lewis mm-hmm. than they did at any point last year. And, and Baldy, you know, when, when you look at Carolina right now, the way they're you know they're trying, I guess, to remake their team, is this the best way to? for them to kind of start. We keep talking about how they didn't have any wide receivers, but to fortify that interior, is, it, is this the best first step, so to speak? Yeah, and I always think that it's, like, everybody's going to pay attention to the tackles, especially in this draft, and it's a good class for, for tackles. But, I mean, if your interior, if your center isn't strong, if your guards can't just keep the pocket flat, I don't care if you're Bryce Young or if you're Joe Burrow or if you're Mahomes. I mean, you've got to get those positions fixed. So that your quarterback has a chance to deliver the ball, short yards, goal line. You got to get a yard. You better be able to move people up front to be able to retain possession, finish drives in the end zone. All those kind of things are really important to the success of any offense, but especially an offense that's trying to be rebuilt and try to, you know, compete right now this year. I think it starts up front and in the mm-hmm. trenches. I think they got two, you know, guys that are still young, still have the best football right, right in front of them on their second contracts, you can build with those guys and around those guys. Yeah, buddy, when your quarterback sacks 62 times, protecting him up the middle, obviously <laughs> extremely important. I just want them to change their identity as well. I want the Panthers to kind of have that, you know, in-your-face identity. I love that Damian Lewis said that when he was, you know, at his press conference. I'm going to be the type of guy that puts your face in the ground. They need that in, in, in Carolina. Let's yeah. go to a, your second team in terms of the trenches in – The Houston Texans, Nick Casario, not a big spender in free agency usually, but he went out and made a number of moves 
to help especially this defensive line. We know the way D'Amico Ryans thinks that if you need an elite defense, the D-line's a big part of it. And if you want to be a contender in the AFC, Baldy, you got to go after these AFC quarterbacks. No question. That's how Nick's thinking. That's how D'Amico's thinking, James. And so, you know, D'Amico comes from, you know, a franchise in San Francisco where they wanted to be eight deep on the defensive line. And so, look, Malik Collins, Sheldon Rankins, they were good last year. But they have now added, you know, obviously Daniil Hunter. And after Chris Jones was signed, re-signed by Kansas City and given that big, huge signing bonus, I thought Daniil Hunter was the next best free agent in all of free agency. Coming off his mm. best season, playing opposite of Will Anderson right now. Then you add Danico Autry. And I know this, I know Danico got uh, Nick Casario excited. This guy is just one heck of a football player. Wherever you play. In Tennessee, yep. I thought he was part of the best defensive line of football three years ago. He can rush inside, outside. He's got, count the playoffs, James. He's got 30 sacks the last three years with the Titans. <sighs> he's used to being in a dominant front four defensive team. That's what this looks like. Then you add Foley Fadakasi and Mario, you know, Williams. And you add some of those guys in front. You know, Foley, you know, can really be that, that, uh, that guy that can eat up the double teams to free up Aziz Al-Shahir and, you know, uh, all the linebackers, Christian Harris, that they have there. I think this is quickly being built into one of the better defensive fronts in all of football. They were already great last year mm. against the run. At one point last year, they were number one in the NFL yeah. against the run. I think they finished number two. So they already kind of have that mindset that we're going to stop the run. That's the first phase of getting after Mahomes and Josh Allen and Lamar and some of these teams that you got to get past in the AFC, they're on their way right now. I thought this front really took a step up. And I like I love Jonathan Greenard, but when he left the sign of Minnesota and they went after and got to Neil Hunter, I said they just upgraded that position. Which is crazy because, I yeah. mean, you talked about how Grenard was just so good down there, but Hunter's a guy who just keep, continues to win, right? He can win those individual and those double teams. and you got to consistently have that guy. But you also have to have tackles to keep those guys off your quarterbacks, which leads us to your number one team that is upgraded uh, in the trenches. Who you got, Baldy? Because I do think these moves are actually more hit or miss. You hit big or you miss big with these moves? Well, the New York Jets. And so, you know, obviously the Jets were a mess last year. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, four plays. I mean, we know the story. But, you know, uh, they have to get this thing right. It, it, that nobody's been a more fractured, injured offensive line than the New York Jets. They've just missed on players. And so Tyron Smith comes in. Um, look, he has protected the backside of Tony Romo and Dak Prescott over the last 11 years. He's been excellent, but he has missed time. Um, you know, he did play 15 games last year. So uh, that's if, if they could get 13 to 15 games out of Tyron, that's a win. Three years ago, they had Morgan Moses, and he played great for him. And then they let him walk to the Baltimore Ravens where he literally, you know, uh, was the starting right tackle on a team that led the league in rushing, was a dominant player there. Um, he's going into his 11th season. Uh, he did miss a couple games last year uh, with an arm injury, but for the most part, he's been healthy. So they get Morgan Moses back, and then they went and signed John Simpson, who I was a big fan of. He came out of Clemson. He started every game last year for the Baltimore Ravens. They led the league in rushing, but it's not its not just that. It's the way that he plays, Steve. Like, he's a puller. You know, they run traps. They run powers. They run counters. Like, he's used to getting in space and clearing bodies out of the way. And I can see an offensive line right now with John Simpson on one side, Oliver Tucker on the other side, where they get that power game going with Brees Hall. They drafted Joe Pitt, uh, Tipman last year to be their center. He became their center last year. I can see for the first time... The Jets can put a starting five out there. I don't think they're finished yet. They're picking number 10. It's an offensive tackle draft. Um, but I can't see them taking number 10 right now with an offensive tackle after what they've just done. They can start addressing the receiver position, the tight end position, some other things that could help Aaron Rodgers. 
Oh my God, Ball! Hey, Jay, Baldy's giving Jets Ball, fans hope. Oh my gosh, they're going to lose I, their minds. I, I, I love it because th- this is what this is what I wanted to get to though, Baldy. With 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 the players that they signed, and you mentioned the number tenth overall pick, and, and this is what I want your take on because you're right. They can get another offensive lineman with ten, and they could totally go that route. And that guy is not plugged in to be an immediate need type of player in their rookie season, maybe. But also, you mentioned the other ways that they can go. I also look at the ability now, if you're not forced into that spot, yeah, you could go block, really block, you could go Brock Bowers, you could go to the tight end spot, you could go a variety of ways, you get an edge rusher to replace Huff, but also you could maybe maybe move back, because they only have picks 10 in 72 yeah. in the top 100. That's it. So you could potentially, if somebody wants a quarterback, right, you could make a move to even get yourself a little bit deeper. No question. Joe Douglas comes from Baltimore and Philadelphia where, you know, whether it's Ozzie Newsom or Howie Roseman, the guys that he has worked for um, are used to dancing up and down that draft board and and really recuperating mm-hmm. um, value. And so that's certainly a possibility right now. Um, both tackles, Tyron Smith and Morgan Moses, they're both 33 years old. Um, you know, you got yep. to think about the future, but Aaron Rodgers – I don't know what, what you know. What is his time frame here? Two years at the most. Like you should probably give him every chance to be successful, and to see just you know the talent that he is. Give him every chance right now. Obviously, signing Mike Williams might take him away from wide receiver. Maybe yep. Brock Bowers. You know, you know, maybe other uh, you know a franchise type player. But at the same time, it's not a bad idea to kind of look to the future because Aaron Rodgers isn't going to be there forever. True. So. They have a lot of flexibility at number 10 to go up, to go down, um, to draft for the future, or to get themselves a star player where they could plug them and just say, you know what, we're going for it all. We're, we're in this thing to win it. Let's go for it this year. And if it doesn't I work like out, be there. Yeah. we'll be back in the market again. They're going for it all, Baldy. They got their hands up on the roller coaster. <laughs> there is no planning for the future <laughs> on this one. Hey, so, Baldy, let me get to So, we know at the top of the draft, the first three picks likely are going to be quarterbacks, right? We also know you got that cluster. You got the Vikings, Raiders, and Broncos that also need quarterbacks. Which team, speaking of the trenches, is kind of best set up to help a rookie quarterback succeed in terms of an offensive line? Hmm. Well, you know, the offense line is also a function of, you know, how your receivers win on the outside. And so, if you're the Minnesota Vikings right now, and I know Sam Darnold is there, but at 11, or if they, you know, stay there, move, whatever. If they're looking at a quarterback, I mean, to hand it off to Aaron Jones, it's going to be nice. To throw to Justin Jefferson or Jordan Addison or TJ Hawkinson is going to be nice for anybody. But I feel like they've got... A pretty good offense line as it is. They have protected Kirk Cousins. And, you know, if you think about last week's, last year's big win for Minnesota when they beat the 49ers and Kirk Cousins dropped back 45 times in that game, Steve, he wasn't sacked one time. Um, you know, they, they did a pretty good job of protecting a variety of quarterbacks last year after Kirk got hurt. And so I feel like the Vikings are the best set up right now to handle a young quarterback coming in and possibly potentially playing right away. Man, this is such great love stuff, it. Baldy. JP, this is such good stuff. I love it. Like, this is what we love to do on the show, Baldy. Have you on and just – let's talk the real football stuff, not just the hyperbole yeah, and all that. So, real good stuff. Yeah. So, Baldy, we know yeah, you're ready to go on vacation. We're going to be looking for more of your breakdowns from underwater. So, safe travels, my friend. Bon voyage. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, Steve. Coming up after the break, oh, we are talking edge rushers, or more specifically, Lance Zerline, our draft analyst. And man, has he got it loaded up for you. Stick around and come back to the NFL Report. Hold the tape, LC. Back at the NFL Report, and you're looking at Mike McCarthy, Terrell Austin, the Steelers defensive coordinator there at the Alabama Pro Day. Mike Tomlin was in the house, and they're probably keeping their eye on edge rusher Dallas Turner, one of the top players in the country, supposed to be a very high pick. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But before we get to that, let's go to our Tom Pellicero, who is at the Pro Day, who caught a spot with Dallas Turner. I feel like I should be the first defensive player off the board because of the tenacity I bring to the game. 
my IQ, how fast I play, and, you know, just uh, being the most versatile edge in the draft as well, you know, being able to pass, rush, and drop, and, you know, and just help my teammates and be the best team I could possibly be. So I know you're sticking around Tuscaloosa after this, but you got some team visits. Where are all you headed? I'm headed to, uh, I know I got to go to Atlanta, uh, Minnesota. I got to go to Chicago and uh, Arizona. All right, Dallas Turner naming three teams that could use an edge rusher, but you look at this board right here, there's an awful lot. You've got the Bears, we will probably use a ninth pick on one if they use it, Atlanta, the Jets, the Vikings, the Broncos, Seahawks, Rams, Dolphins, Buffalo Bills, Lions. Who doesn't need an edge rusher? But James Palmer, we're back here on the NFL Report. We're going to bring in our draft expert, Lance Zerline, who knows there these is. edge rushers well. And Lance, you just saw Dallas Turner there with Tom Pelissero yeah. say, he should be the first defensive player off the board. First off, just your thoughts on Turner. Well, so Dallas Turner, you know, I first noticed him when he was really giving Charles Cross work at Mississippi State when I was studying Charles Cross a couple of years ago. And I had to go to the roster because if you're not draft eligible, I don't have time to look at you right now. But I got 500 players to write up. But I made note of who's number 15, <laughs> Dallas Turner. Wow, I'm going to remember this kid. And here we are two years later. And, you know, I think he's a similar player. He's he's a little bit gangly looking on the hook, but he was over 250 pounds at his pro day, which was heavier than at the combine. I think that's great. Uh, 20 reps at, in the bench, which I thought was nice. But really, Steve, what kind of separates Dallas Turner is, yes, he comes from that Alabama pedigree of rushers, but he is a really elite athlete. I mean, from an explosion standpoint at the combine, his speed numbers, his ability to bend and make things happen, and once he's inside the pocket, change direction and hound quarterbacks who are trying to get away from him. I think if you want a guy who has that the rush talent that's typical of Alabama rushers, and then you want to look at the athletic profile that it's an elite profile, including extraordinarily long arms and wingspan, Dallas, Dallas gives you Dallas Turner gives you a very uh unique set of skills, so to speak, when it comes to the pass rush. There's there's four key rushers in the first round, but he's a guy that kind of blends all of them together. I love that. He's a Liam Neeson. He blends it all together, Lance. I love <laughs> you. mentioned the speed. I mean, four four seven at the combine. That was about as fluid Crazy. as you could see a big man yeah. run in the 40, as smooth as he looked. And you mentioned the athletic ability, a, a fantastic basketball player. Uh, in high school. I know everybody always kind of looks at those traits as well when they're evaluating some of these guys. To spread that out, you mentioned these edge rushers, and there's about four of them you mentioned. But where do we see, I know you have another mock draft coming out soon, and it's not out yet, right. but where would we see, as we hinted at it, the first defensive player go off the board, and will it be Dallas Turner? I think it could be Turner. I think it's going to be between Turner and Verse, Jared Verse, and I'll get into J Jared Verse in a second. But, you know, Chop Robinson from Penn State is a, is a huge projection player, great traits, but he's not there yet. So I think he will okay. probably be fourth. A lot to his draft standing is going to be, you know, determined by his medicals. But I think when you start looking at – you guys talked to Baldy and you started looking at the way some of these teams are coming together from a free agency standpoint, and now it may change. You know, the Jets may look at a pass rusher, for example, with their selection. I think that, you know, Minnesota, obviously, if they ended up staying there and not making a move for quarterback, which we anticipate, I think they need rush. And so I think probably the earliest you're going to see a pass rusher would be uh, maybe the Falcons could be the absolute earliest at eight, but you could make a point for mm -hmm. going even earlier than that because these are really, I think, high ceiling, high floor players at this particular position at the edge, and especially Jared Verse. And let's start talking about Jared Ver Verse for a second. I mean, Jared Verse is a powerhouse. He is as explosive as it gets into the blockers. Very heavy with his hands. He's good against the run and the pass. You know, Dallas Turner's not going to be as good against the run as Jared Verse says. He has become a real issue for tackles to handle. The same way Aaron Donald was this unusually powerful guy inside for his size, Jared Verse is unusually powerful and twitchy with his upper body strength against tackles who are much heavier than him. He's got a great bull rush. He improved some of his rush technique and, and rush moves uh, headed into this year. So I think going back to school, he really made himself a more complete player. But I, I don't think... You know, we, we look how many of these these things that we're showing you are run plays. That's one of the things that separates him, I think, from mm -hmm. the other. Uh, and why I think he's going to be the first guy off the board personally is that he is a two-way defensive end okay. with tremendous toughness. 
You know, I, I love hearing stuff like this because uh, you, you talk about Atlanta there at eight. We know Raheem Morris kind of plays that hybrid 34. You know, he's going to give you that, that even look. But you want to have somebody who can play the run in the past like him. And you've got a Grady Jarrett. And you've got David Onyemata. You've got tackles who can make plays. So somebody like him might be a perfect fit right there. And you talk about a hybrid guy. And this is a guy we both love, Lance, out of the University of Missouri. Yeah. There he's Robinson. And this Here is somebody – here we this go. Is where, but this is where I want you to educate people because he's listed in some places as an edge, other places as a D tackle. A few years mm-hmm. ago, we'd say he's a 34-5 technique. But he's shown yeah. a little bit more than that, though. Like, when you're evaluating a combo big man like him, he's a big freaking guy, like 285. How do you kind of put him in there when you're talking about the Turners and the Verses and Chop Robinson? It's a, it's a great question. It's what I had to do last year with Keon White, who ended up going to New England out of right. Georgia Tech. Very similar body type, similar uh, gameplay. The Texans just signed Danico Autry. And every the talk in Houston on my sports talk show is, well, wait a minute, is he going to play edge? Is he going to play defensive tackle? He's a little small. D'Amico doesn't play a traditional odd front. So what are you going to do? You want to put good football players on your team. Listen, whether they're rushing or playing base off the edge, I think the way I envision it, Steve, is I think he's going to play base edge on on first down and second down on the rundowns. You want that power off the edge. But then when it comes down to pure sub-package rushing, when we're in third and six and you know they're going to throw, we're going to bump him inside and use his quickness and that lean mass to uh, to really overwhelm and outquick some of the guards. So I think, you know, for me, it used to be a bigger concern when you when you had players and they didn't fit neatly into a bucket. Now they're called hybrids. Now they're good. Before we used to call them tweeners. Tweeners, right. no good. Right. Hybrids, great. So, you know, for me, Darius Robinson, whatever you want to do with him, can he play defense tackle? Sure, he can gain 10 more pounds and play there. He lost weight to play D end, and he's in great physical shape right now. So I think it's a matter of what you want him to do, and that's why I think he's such a good fit for the Lions. I keep plugging him in with the Lions in my mock draft. because I just think it really fits what Aaron Glenn and Dan Campbell want up there, and I think he fits into that front that they're looking for. He's from Detroit, too, so that would be huge. Anybody to help yeah. Aiden Hutchinson, man. You get him oh, somebody man. else. It, 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 it is, it is going to be something to see, Lance. I love that. And I love that that's the way you finished it because I was already thinking here. And, and this is what I wanted to follow up with. You mentioned tweeners and you mentioned those guys that you always kind of go, well, do they, if they don't have a position, does that mean they, 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 they are a knock? But then when we see people play it at the highest level, say, I'm not making the comparison, but a Chris Jones that can move inside and outside and different type of players that can do it. But if you can't do it at that type of level, is it a knock still? But if you and if you don't get into that elite category to where you can do multiple things. Ooh, good question. I think it's tough. I mean, mm. it really depends on who's drafting them. And I always, when I put grades on players, my assumption is always that the team that views him as the best particular fit with the scheme is going to is who's going to draft him. So if you have a zone scheme running back or a gap scheme running back, I'm assuming the offensive coordinator and the mm-hmm. offensive play caller is going to get with the general manager and say, this is a guy who fits, this is a guy who doesn't. So it's going to make sense if they're going to be on your board if you have a game plan for them. And I think there's something also to be said for, mm-hmm. I think the best coaches understand how to get talent acclimated and how to work around a special player's strengths and weaknesses. Kalai Jacansi, undersized defensive tackle, but he's already showing flashes over there with the Bengals. And I think, you know, is he small for a defensive tackle in the first round? Absolutely. But can he do something that makes the Bengals a good football team? Yes, he can. Keep him out of the instances where he's going to be double teamed by guards and centers and driven off the ball and put him in positions to be a penetrator and a disruptor. So it's up to the team to put the player in the right type of scheme and the right situation. And then for coaches to work around the weaknesses and accentuate the strengths. So let's let's stay here. Let's stay in this pocket. When we look at the number of quarterbacks, look, Minnesota made a move. You know, getting that, that second first round draft pick to probably move up. So let's say there's going to be four to five quarterbacks. Let's, we're talking about these edge rushers. We also know there's some elite wide receivers at the top end. How is that going to affect the stacking of the draft in terms of pushing talented players like maybe a Darius Robinson or Chop Robinson to the back part of the draft where some teams sitting there in their 20s hmm. could be like Merry Christmas? Yeah. So it's tricky. Uh, it, it, this draft seems to have a flow. Now, free agency has kind of tricked it out a little bit, right. but it's going to be an early 
You know, it's going to be early quarterbacks, mm-hmm. right? And then I think the next thing is going to be wide receivers that start to go. We'll see the top three wide receivers come off the board with sprinklings of offensive tackle. So it's going to be quarterback followed by wide receiver, then comes offensive tackle with a chance of one rusher and Brock Bowers being considered there. Now, Brock is the wild card. I don't I don't know where Brock goes. I thought the point that, you know, uh, um, Baldy made the point about maybe Brock Bowers could go to the Jets. All of a sudden, that makes a lot of sense when you think about what they're trying to do with the all-in approach for uh, Aaron Rodgers. But, you know, but then it's going to go, it's going to take on an offensive tackle vibe, followed by cornerbacks, and then here come the wide receivers led by Brian Thomas again. And Chop Robinson, the wild cards in this one who could fall, I think are a lot too due to health. Chop Robinson due to inexperience. And then Bowers, just because tight ends are hard to slot in the top 10, top 12 picks of the draft. And I think uh, Terry and Arnold versus Quinion Mitchell is a real yeah. wild card in terms of who's going to be first corner off the board. I, I'm starting to think it's going to be Mitchell 1, Terry and Arnold 2. Mm. Man, Lance, we're going to get to these corners with you on another show because we had a plan for it, but, man, we love these edge rushers, so we had to stick with this. But we will get to the corners, I I promise. I always do And I also like that you stole my idea of Brock Bowers to the Jets and gave it to Baldy, so I appreciate that as well. But, Lance, thank you so much for the insight (laughs) on all of these guys. I like Dallas Turner. You like Jared Verse. I love the way we're going because these two right here, it might be the first defensive player off the board. It's going to be really, really Really fun to watch. We're going to have you back to talk corners. Looking forward to it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Coming up on the NFL Report, speaking of corners, how about Kenny Moore? Just got himself a handsome bag to return to the Indianapolis Colts. And, man, that nickel position, Steve, we love that spot. Love it. On the defensive side of the ball. We're going to talk to Kenny Moore after this on the NFL Report. Welcome back to the NFL Report. James Palmer, Steve Weich with you. And Steve, we are joined by our first repeat guest. Let's go. And it's only (laughs) fitting that Kenny Moore of the Indianapolis Colts joins us as our first repeat, Steve. Because, Kenny, you know what we think of your position. On this show, how much we love talking about the slot corner spot and how much we love to break down what you do in the middle of the field. First, though, I have to say thank you for joining us. And secondly, congratulations on the contract. What's the first thing that goes through your mind once you know that is signed, sealed, delivered, and you know that you're locked in? What goes through Kenny Moore's mind? First off, it's great to be back with you guys to be the first repeat. That's pretty awesome. Um, The first first thing that went through my mind whenever... We got the contract, you know, signed, sealed, and d- delivered. Um, I was just thinking about, you know, I'm ready to go work again because I know I know where I'll be at. Woo. I know the people that I'll be with. Uh, you know, I get to see all my friends again. So uh, from here, we just got to, you know, put some banners up and um, go back to work. So I'm, I'm fully excited to, to be with the organization again. And then, like I said, just to know, you know, where I'll be. I love that you're excited to be with the organization again. But, Kenny, I mean, there was a lot of reports at least that, then nobody was real certain that was going to be the case. Were you were you close with any other teams? Um, I mean, yeah, there were negotiations and talks with you know uh, quite a few teams, but um, the Colts they were in it the entire way. They they never pulled out. They never uh, you know came into the talks. You know later later on in in the uh, the process, but. Um, they, they stuck it out the entire way, and, you know, they believed in me, and they wanted me back nice. in the organization. I'm glad to be back. So so with that, I mean, they wanted you back in the organization. What does it feel like as a player, though, to know you've had an impact on a community and on a club as to where they invested with you the way they did in three more years? Oh, uh, man, that's a great question. Um, they just know what I give at this point. Um, you know, one thing of knowing, you know, I guess what a player does and and knowing what he gives, I think, you know, the world of that, you know, they value and appreciate, you know, not only the player that I am, but the person I am throughout the community and how I'm able to make an impact and uh, just being uh, the kind of guy that wants, you know, everybody to be included. So, uh, yeah, it's a great image to have on such a prestige uh, organization. I love that. And and Kenny, you you signed this contract, three years, $30 million, yet you're the highest paid guy for about, 
I don't know, a day, couple days, and Taron Johnson gets paid too, and it's right up there with yours. What, I, I want to know, does that bug you at all? But also, what is it like seeing you guys in this role, when I talk to defensive coordinators and how important it is that you guys are getting your due yep. playing this position? Um, I like to say, you know, we're just pioneers of the position. Uh, you know, we wear the heavy hat. Yes. We wear the hard hat. Uh, we, we do a lot of things that uh, make a lot of things come together. And, uh, you know, for this position to be rotating that safety, to be able to blitz, to be able to cover, and to be able to, you know, read zones and, and read the quarterback. And uh, it's a lot of things that we got to uh, be able to do to be able to be uh, uh, yep. inside cornerback or a slot cornerback. You know, the outside corners, everybody can do it. And so, um, you know, Teron, whenever he, <laughs> whenever he uh, made the jump to be the next highest paid, um, it was really great for him. It was great for the position. And I think he and I and, and many more to come, you know, we got to walk for, you know, the others to run, you know, later in the day, later in, later in football. So I think we're just making history here. And, um, you know, we all just trying to play the position awesome. at, the, at the highest level. We just need, you know, more nickels to do the same thing. Yeah, and this is music to our ears because, like James said, we, we love that slot DB position. You know, especially do. at a time when you're seeing, like, you know, the regular safeties are, are floating out there on the market like they are, so teams are reprioritizing. Well, you talked earlier, Kenny, about saying you're back in Indianapolis with your friends. The Colts have re-signed so many players that were free agents there, going from Zaire Franklin to some of the players like that to Michael Pittman, um, the wide receiver. And, and, and what about, you know, bringing back so many players, especially a guy like Pittman, who you probably bang with a lot in practice? You said, what is it like? Yeah, bringing back so many guys who, you know, who've been there before. Yeah, just having that continuity. Uh, you know, I was there a couple years in before Michael Pittman Jr. came into the Colts facility. And, you know, I'm able to watch him grow uh, th over the years. You know, I was there when Zaire was on the brink of going to another team, you know, getting cut his rookie year to now. He's been extended. Um, it's been great, and his role has been, you know, the leader of the defense. He's been, you know, with myself and Buck. You know, we're all just trying to do this thing together, and uh, if we're going to win, we want to win together. So we don't want to see anybody leave. We want to make sure that, you know, we stay accountable to each other and make sure we put the, the hard work in, you know, day in and day out, and we can go out here and win some games together. Uh, you know, these guys that I'm actually proud of, you know, as the people that they are to, you know, seeing them grow. You guys won some games. I'll say right here on this show, Kenny, I thought your head coach should have been coach of the year in what Shane Steichen was able to do in his first year in Indianapolis. Now Gardner Minshew is out of the building, even though he played great, subbing in for Anthony Richardson throughout the course of the season. Now this is AR's, AR's team. What have you seen or heard or talked to your quarterback about moving forward with him being the guy and the face of your franchise if you're going to win more of these games in year two with your head coach and your quarterback? I think he has enough people in his ear, you know, telling him of what we need. And uh, I'm pretty sure he knows exactly, you know, the position that he's in. They've given him an incredible um, position to be in, to lead the Colts, to lead the, the city of Indianapolis mm -hmm. uh, to win. So um, I talked to him on the day that I signed back and he was fired up to have me back. And I was the same way, just having him as, as my quarterback nice. and, and him there, you know, being supportive. But uh, I'm ready to go, and I'm ready to be supportive of him this spring as he gets back on the field and uh, see what we can do together. Yeah, look, he made some more fans in Indianapolis with his Good Love Samaritan it. Act the other day, taking somebody whose car broke down to the shop and giving yeah. some money to buy some tools to change his tire. So good for him. Kenny Moore, thank you so much. We wish you had more time. But, again, thanks for joining us again. Congratulations on everything. First repeat. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. First repeat, much Absolutely. Yes. So when we come back on the NFL report, you know, you want to take your son to get his haircut like Patrick Mahomes. Well, coming up, we'll be joined by someone who can tell you how you can get that type of crispy cut and enjoy reading books at the same time. Interesting stuff on the NFL report. Welcome back to the NFL report. One of the many highlights of Super Bowl week in Las Vegas was an event that had nothing to do with the outcome of the Chiefs 49ers matchup. NFL inspired change in conjunction with the Clark County Library District hosted a grand opening to celebrate the launch of Barbershop Books, 
Now, this is a nonprofit organization that focuses on creating child friendly reading spaces for boys in barber shops. Let's take a look. We are here today because the NFL, in partnership with the NFL Foundation, have helped Barbershop Books come to Las Vegas. Welcome! Welcome to the Las Vegas Clark County Library. This is a great day, and it's an incredible honor to be hosting the kickoff of Barbershop Books to our Las Vegas community today. The Barbershop Books Literacy Program is just another stellar example of bringing the library to more places where people gather. We're partnering with the Las Vegas Clark County Library District to create child-friendly reading spaces in 10 barbershops right here in Las Vegas. We're gonna be bringing together 150 kids. That's a lot of kids. We'll have some reading stations and then we're also gonna be giving away free haircuts and free books. Alright, do me a favor, read that one. I've been in the education library sector for almost 30 years. What's driven me in education and libraries and children has been just the impact and the change that literacy can have on kids. Do you like to read? Yes. Why? I don't know, I just want. All right, there we go. What a great project, JP. And now we are joined by the founder of Barbershop Books. That is Alvin Ur Irby. Alvin, thanks for joining us here from New York. And just tell us this concept of Barbershop Books. Where did it start? So I was teaching first grade in the Bronx, um, and there was a barbershop across the street from my school. So one day after school, I'm getting a haircut, and one of my students, you know, comes into the shop, plops down on the sofa, and he's just kind of, you know, antsy, looking bored. And all I can keep thinking is like, he should be practicing his reading right now. And I wished I had a children's book, but I didn't. So it was really that chance encounter with one of my students. Uh, Alvin, I, I love the piece that we watched. I, saw, I have an 11 year old. I think I saw a couple of Captain Underpants books, a lot of yes. different books that he reads at home as well. <laughs> as we were looking through all this different stuff featured there, um, you, you do a lot of different things and you have taken this to a grand scale. I mean, you've done TED Talks, you've been in the New York Times, you've been on, you know, Oprah's type stuff. Where do you want this to go? Because you do have grand aspirations. So how far in your mind do you think this could go? I want it in, in, in every barber shop where there are children. You know, I think that over the next five years, we'd like to get to 2,500 uh, barber shops, but I think that that's really just the beginning. Um, I think there's, there's so many opportunities with partners to create spaces in the community uh, that inspire children to read for fun. Well, and Alvin, you know, look, part of this, you know, you're, you're here on the show because you're partners with the NFL and trying to get this done. And you just talked about getting in 2,500 barber shops. What does kind of the sponsorship and then the, being partners with a huge brand like the NFL do in terms of making headway for you to reach your goal? I, it's really important. I think that, you know, it signals to other, you know, organizations and entities um, that this is a, is work worth investing in, um, and I think that uh, it what it does did is it, it created a model, right? Many of our cities have local football teams, um, and so I think that you know it creates an opportunity for us to say, hey, look at this really great example of what's possible, right? When you come together with barbershop books and with amazing partners like the local library. I love that, Alvin. Real quick, we, we, we're tight on time. When Roger Goodell shows up in Las Vegas with you guys to read with kids, what impact does that make? And what did you see from Roger? Well, I mean, one, I uh, was, was, was a little surprised, but also excited that he took the time. I think it, it signals again that this was something that really was important to the NFL and to him. Um, for him to take time out. And I saw him, he was having a good time, you know? So uh, I think it was just an impactful event all, all around. The kids, the uh, adults, everybody. 
Alvin Herbert, the founder of Barbershop oh. Books. What a fantastic project. I was just in, in Inglewood, in Inglewood, California, getting my fade tightened up. I'm a little crispy right now the other day, and there yeah. were no books there for the good, kids Steve. in the shop. So we got to get some books, Alvin. It's my barbershop. Thank you so hey, much for continuing the we're good ready. work. Let's go. Let's go. All right, All right. thank you. I love it. I love All right, it. coming up Appreciate on it, Monday thank here you. on the NFL Report, JP, you know, that handsome guy in the gray suit, he's going to be on vacation. So that ugly guy in the blue suit, yeah. I'm going to be joined by Judy Batista from the league meeting you down it, in I mean. Orlando, 7 p.m. Eastern. Also remember, it's a podcast. And by the way, people, that guy right there, James Palmer, he just jumped out of an airplane. <laughs> I did. I did jump out of an airplane. You'll see that coming up soon.